we begin uh, this morning by looking at some words that were written by King David. Uh, we find them in the 100th Psalm, perfectly suited for Thanksgiving Sunday. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. It is good and right for the people of God to gather in the sanctuary of God and to give thanks for all that God has done for us. Throughout the generations, God has been steadfast to the world in God's care and God's provision and God's love. And God continues to care and provide and love us. And so we come as a community of faith into the sanctuary of God and we offer ourselves in thanksgiving and praise. And it is again good and right that we would do so. And during this week of thanksgiving, it is only appropriate that as a community of faith, we offer ourselves in thanksgiving for what God has done in our midst. I imagine this week in some way, uh, whether small or large, formally or informally, um, you will celebrate Thanksgiving. Um, I wonder uh, if any of you now or when you were growing up, anybody uh, participated in a Thanksgiving where they made everybody go around the table and mention what they were thankful for? <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I did that when I was a kid. Had to do that. We had to do it. Not, not every year. It depended on where I was. But when I was there, and that was a tradition, we had to do it. And I confess that I just hated it. Yeah, I didn't like it. Uh, I felt so, it felt so pressured to me. Like, what, what am I supposed to give thanks What am I supposed to give thanks for? And, you know, there'd be meaningful things, and then there'd be little things. And uh, I just, I never really liked it. It felt kind of like a torturous process, which is why on occasion on, on Thanksgiving now, I like to make my kids do it. Um, <laughs> uh, because it's only fair, right? Um, well, the, the truth is, is that um, now as an adult, um, my Thanksgiving list is a lot more sincere, and it's a lot bigger. Um, and whether we go around and share our individual thanks this week or not, I guarantee you this is going to be a week of thanks in my life. Because I have a lot for which I can be grateful. And even when life is hard, as we talked about at the beginning of worship, even when we're in the darkest times, maybe even in the most challenging times of our lives, there is always something that we can cling to, to give thanks for. And when we do that, we can find the very beginning of hope in the midst of those circumstances. So this week, I really want to encourage you um, to give thanks. To just give thanks in whatever way that you can for all that God has given you in your life, both small and large. Just to not take it for granted. And just to be filled with a thankful heart. What I want to do um, today as a church is to kind of offer our thanks. Uh, I promise I'm not going to go around and make each of you share um, what you're thankful for in the life of our church one at a time. Uh, I'm going to offer that on, on our behalf as pastor. Um, this is my pastoral Thanksgiving list that I want to share with you today. It's not all inclusive, um, but I think it gets us a start. Because I think there's a lot for which we as a community of faith should be grateful. And if we're called to do that individually on Thursday, surely as a family of faith, we're called to do that on this Thanksgiving Sunday. And I want to begin uh, my pastoral Thanksgiving list um, by once again telling you how grateful I am for the saints of this church, for the history of this church. We've talked a lot about that over the last few weeks. And this church has been a part of Louisville since the early 1800s, maybe even as far back as the late 1700s, and what a difference this church has made. I'm so grateful for the saints of this church and the foundation that they built, their generosity that continues to sustain and support us today. What an amazing history that we have. Um, you know, it's funny, people will often say, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. Sometimes those who don't study and know their history are doomed not to repeat it. Because our history in this church is so great that we can only receive the blessing that they've started by repeating and following what they've taught us. We have such a great and strong history. 
And as a pastor, I'm particularly grateful for a guy that we've talked about a little bit throughout this series. Um, uh, the, the pastor of First Christian Church in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, um, the Reverend Dr. Ed, Edward uh, Powell. Um, he was an amazing pastor. He did amazing things. And he had such a vision for the city of Louisville. He wanted Louisville to be an ideal city. An ideal city that was for the world like that city that Jesus described, that city on a hill where people would see it and they would find hope and grace and light and goodness. And he really believed that Louisville was set here by the very hand of God with the purpose of being that ideal city, that light for the rest of the world to see. And Dr. Powell believed that in order for the city to be an ideal city, it had to have within its, um, within its borders ideal churches. And in order to be an ideal church, he said there were two essential things. The church must worship well and faithfully. And the church must be a sanctuary for all. And even in the late 1800s, early 1900s, Dr. Powell believed that the church should be open for everyone. That no one should ever be turned away for any reason from the sanctuary of God. What a bold and powerful thing to say and do in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, the other thing that Dr. Powell said, in addition to worship, the church had to be in service to humankind. That the church had to reach out beyond its doors and make the world a better place. Because we aren't just called to worship, we're called to serve. And so in order to be the ideal church, you had to have both. Worship and service. If you had one but not the other, he called it an impertinence and an offense to God. It had to be both of those things. As I look at the last year in this church, one of the reasons I give such tremendous thanksgiving and praise is because it feels to me like we've lived into Dr. Powell's vision for the church this year as powerfully, if not more powerfully, than we ever have before. We've continued as a church to really focus on what it means to be a sanctuary for all people. And we try so hard to be a meaningful worship community where when we come and gather on Sunday morning, it is with great purpose and with great cause. I'm so grateful that we come into this church now and we see how beautiful it looks. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that uh, several months ago when we worshiped on faded orangish pews, and carpet that had stains that surely told stories for years. Um, I'm not saying we didn't worship great. We didn't have wonderful worship um, in, this, in this room before we renovated it. But isn't it nice to come into the sanctuary of God and see it looking the way it does? It's only been this way for a couple of months, but I, but I can't uh, imagine growing tired of walking into this space and the improvements that we've done and, and what we've been able to accomplish through it to enhance worship. I don't imagine growing tired of it anytime soon. And if you don't believe in miracles, we did all of this without splitting the church. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. People are like, nothing splits a church like changing carpet. Um, but you know what? We did. Because that's the kind of church we are. And they did a wonderful job. And I love coming into this sanctuary and worshiping in this space. And I'm so grateful that we can do that. I'm also grateful that we're a church that doesn't just come into worship. But we're a church that goes out and serves humankind. That we live into that other half of what Dr. Powell was talking about. And, and I know that you know as we send out um, these reminders, these stories every day. I can't imagine that you got to see and read through all of them. Um, uh, they really are remarkable. And, and I have to tell you, there's, there's been days where I've kind of been moved to tears by just the inspiration that it has given me and the hope that it has given me to look and see what you've done. It is amazing. Um, I, 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 I've never seen anything like it in a church in one year. I really haven't. Um, so what I want to do is in the spirit of thanksgiving, I want to share with you what you've done. And this isn't an all-inclusive thing. These are things that have just been made possible by the Holy Grant thing that we started this year. I'm going to have to go quick, so buckle up and hang on. Um, but every story is one that we need to offer to God today um, because I'm so grateful for each one. Our first homeless grant was given to our teenagers. You know, our teens have often served as leaders in ministry in this church. And this year they took a homeless grant and, and they made 100 Share the Warmth kits. And there they are praying over them. And those Share the Warmth kits were taken downtown and they were handed out last February um, to Louisville's, to members of Louisville's homeless community. 
The second grant went to Alan Parsons. Alan, not directly to Alan Parsons, but Alan was in charge of the big day of serving. And this was a huge undertaking. It took several months and tons and tons of hard work. But in early October, hundreds of adults, and uh, over 100 adults and youth came into Louisville. They worshipped together, and then they went out throughout the city and worked in multiple locations to make an impact and to improve Louisville and make it a better place for those who call this city home. Uh, and this is just the beginning. Uh, next year, Alan's going to work. We've got something even bigger planned. There's going to be a lot more students and adults here. Um, can't wait to see what comes. This was just the warm-up. Uh, we formed a relationship this year with Cameron Middle School and Ballard High School. And through a program called Cub Strong, um, there is a mentor that's coming in and working with 20 families uh, at each of those schools, 20, 20 at-risk students and their families to help them make better life choices so that they can help kind of break the chain of what has been so hard for some of their most at-risk population. We also partnered with Westport, um, with Westport Middle. Uh, Carolyn Hoagland, who's a member of our church, is a teacher there. Um, they have a very high percentage of what they call GAP students, um, and, and they struggle with resources. They're using 12-year-old textbooks to make, to make things work really, really hard. So she had an idea, and she came to us, she said, if we could increase technology access, we could open up a whole new world to these students. And, and, and through a grant, we were, able to in, we were able to provide increased technology access to over 200 students at Westport Middle. Don't think that makes a difference? Um, talk to Carolyn Hoagland and ask her what a difference that's making every single day. Uh, we partnered with St. Stephen Football and Cheer, um, and, and through our uh, grant, we're able to fund 37 boys and girls to play football who wouldn't have had the chance to do so otherwise. Two of those, two of those players, we heard last week, live at Wayside. A couple weeks ago, live at Wayside Christian Mission, and they're picked up every day by their coaches and taken to practice and then taken back to the shelter afterward. Um, we made that possible. 20 of the kids that we funded this year ended up being on a championship team. They'll never forget that. We're so appreciative for what we were able to help them do. Um, Cheryl Cubbage and her son Brendan had a great homeless ministry where they took, um, where they invited residents of the Parkland neighborhood and the Parkland Family Scholar House, and they went to Oxmoor Farm and they learned about um, healthy, sustainable food choices and, and how to eat healthy and provide good nutrition for your family um, in a way that's affordable and doable. Um, what a great day. I, I love that story. Uh, Veronica Birkenbosch is a member of our congregation, and she volunteers at Eastern Area Community Ministries, uh, and she works with their help. Their, there's a Helping Hands partnership there, which is designed to help get people off of dependency and into greater in, in, independency. Um, this grant provides 25 families with milk each week. Um, you know, we take milk for granted, but imagine not being able to get your kids milk. What a, what a great way to show support and care. Most of us are familiar with New Life in Christ Christian Church. New Life in Christ Christian Church is a church that takes place behind prison bars. It's at the, the, the Dismas House Charities in, in Deerson House. And um, they do remarkable work. And, and we've long been partnered with them. But this year, for the first time, because of our grants, we were able to fund them. We were able to send them $5,000 to make a difference. Their, their congregation can't give the way we do. If people like us didn't give to support their ministries, that church would close. And I am telling you, that church is changing lives. It is a remarkable place of faith. Um, we, we were also able to serve this year in a new way. Um, through the past a few years, we've had nurture and accountability groups, support groups for, for inmates who are transitioning from behind bars to beyond bars. And we've done a great job with that. But this year, because we had some funding for the first time, we've been able to provide starter kits. Um, when you come out of prison, you don't have much. Um, and sometimes the, what little you have just disappears so quickly it's hard to get over the hump to sustainability. Well, with some gift cards, some gas, and the ability to make some phone calls, it allows you to just not have to worry so hard at the very beginning and to kind of get a head start. What a great way to support them. Um, the Kling Center, a senior center here in town that we uh, partnered with, and we, we stocked their pantry with some great toiletry items that their clients couldn't otherwise afford. You just heard the story of the Browns Barrel Hills um, healthcare and what's going on there. And, and if you're interested in that, please talk to Mary Beth because that's going to be continuing. Uh, Forgotten Louisville's been going on for a while. Uh, we have a group of very, very faithful church members who go down every single week, rain or shine, warm or cold, light or dark, and they're down there providing um, Louisville's homeless community with some essentials that they need each week. Um, the grant provided them with a tent to stay dry. Seems reasonable. A portable table they can carry down to spread out what, they, what they're passing out, and some lights to light the night um, during, during those dark winter evenings. 
Um, this is Greg Scales. Greg's on your right. Um, Greg's parents are sitting to his right. Uh, 20 years ago, Greg's dad was diagnosed with leukemia. And if it wasn't for organizations like the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, um, Greg's dad might not have enjoyed the recovery that he did. And he's alive and then doing well. We're so grateful for that. Um, partly in honor of his dad, Greg participated um, in the uh, Leukemia Lymphoma Society Man and Woman of the Year this year. Uh, and he worked really, really hard. And through his hard work, um, he was able to raise over $16,000 to support that great organization. And we were a small part of that, but we were a part of that. And Greg, thank you so much for working so hard to make that happen. Um, Sandy Selby's working on a cup of joe for St. John's. Um, St. John's Homeless Shelter downtown. Sometimes you think, what difference can a cup of coffee make? Ask that to someone who's homeless on a cold winter day. Um, ask me at about 9 o'clock any morning. <laughs> a cup of coffee makes a big difference. Um, uh, through our homeless grant and through the donations that you all have made, uh, we were able to give what their staff called the largest single donation of coffee and supplies ever given at any one time for St. Joe's. Uh, we partnered with um, Louisville Metro Health and Department of Health and Wellness um, to provide 50 safe sleep kits through Cribs for Kids. This was a matching grant. You gotta love it when you give a grant and it gets doubled, right? We gave a grant, it was doubled. It's paying for 50 safe sleep kits. What are, what are safe sleep kits? Um, they, they're given to low income families. They include a crib, sheets, all kinds of things. But most importantly, they include um, education. They're delivered personally to these families and they're shown how to set up the crib and they're taught about safe sleep. Too many infants die every year because families don't know about safe sleep practices. Um, Cribs for Kids is a, is a passionate group that's helping to kind of address those issues. Hard to look at again, but also hard to forget these images. Um, just a few months ago, uh, this is just one picture of many that could be shown of the desecration that took place at the mosque on River Road uh, when people went and defamed their sacred property um, because they're afraid of them and wanted to say something negative about them. We had started with a grant to something called a Partnership for Peace uh, because the greatest way to alleviate fear and hatred is to build understanding. And so we started a program where we might be able to build some understanding with the Muslim neighbors. And when this happened, we had already planned to go worship with them that week. And members of our congregation gathered two days after this took place. We worshiped with them, and then the larger community of Louisville came together to show support. It was just astonishing to paint over and clean all of that. Um, not too long after that, we partnered with the uh, Turkish community here in Louisville, and we went together with them and Peace Catalyst International, and, and uh, we bought some meat and, and a group of our folks who I just think look really fine. They are rocking those hair nets. Um, and uh, Tommy didn't have his on. He got in trouble, which I think is even, even more beautiful. But, you know, it's always going to be a little hot water time. Um, so so um, they went down and made just a tremendous difference. They, they served that meal at an emergency and transitional housing uh, place. Um, and we had enough volunteers go that as one of their um, residents said, we got to eat like restaurant style. And it was really special for that child. We partnered with the Week of Compassion, which is our church's international benevolent arm, and they reach out whenever there's a natural or human-made disaster to make a difference. Um, we sent them a grant, and they use that grant to go and alleviate the immense suffering that's being caused by the European refugee crisis. And so your hands are in the midst of making that a better situation. Um, Kathy Oligas, one of our church members, started a food pantry lending, a, a lending library for our food pantry clients for the children. I was just down there this week and watching families pull books off of that for their children was about as heartwarming a thing as I've seen in a long time. Speaking of our food pantry, we were able to use a grant this year to buy a pallet lifter, a pallet jack, so, we don't have to, so that they can move those big pallets of food a lot easier. And we also provided them with an emergency disbursement of money so that they could supplement this month's food pantry and next month's food pantry um, because, the, because the stock is low and the demand is high this time of year. Um, this is Michael and Lucia Adams. Um, they're members of our church. Uh, Lucia was born in Guatemala, and Michael is her, her adopted father, and her, um, uh, her, um, her mother, her adopted mother, Sarah, um, they wanted to find Lucia's birth family. And so they went. It's a remarkable story. They went and searched and searched and searched, and they found her. And, and her name is Wilma. Uh, but Wilma lives with Lucia's sister and um, her grandmother. Um, they live in a, in a house that is not suitable for living, and it's not safe, and it's not permanent. Um, and so they started a fund called Building Hope so that they could buy property and build a safer house for Lucia's birth mom. Um, Lucia started it by asking people, instead of giving her birthday presents, to donate to that. Yeah, that's just awesome, and a child shall lead them, good Lord. 
Um, so we, we provided a grant for that. Um, one of the things I love about the story is we told the story in video and put it out there. It was our most shared story over the last 21 days. Um, within 24 hours after we're posting it, the fund for that house went up over $1,500. Just like that. Just phenomenal. Um, it, uh, th this, is, this isn't even the whole list. There's some stuff that's not on there, and, and we've just flown through it. If you haven't had a chance to see this, I really want you to go to stakeyourclaim.info and go to the What We've Done page and just scroll down. There's videos, there's slideshows, there's stories, there's details. Your story is being demonstrated there in a way that is just beyond care, beyond, beyond compare. I'm telling you, I have never seen a church do so much in one year's period of time. It is astonishing. Um, in, in, in every trend, churches are heading in a different direction. But, but our church is not. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, and, but here's the reality. The reason that we're sitting in this beautified space um, and can have the worship that we do, the reason we were able to do all of these things is because last year you all stepped up and said we want to get off that investment income. If you hadn't been more generous in your gifts to the church this year, none of these stories would have been written. None of them, not a one, because every one of these stories that I've just talked about has been made possible because of the above and beyond giving that we've done over our operating budget. My, thanks, my pastoral thanksgiving list would be a lot shorter if it weren't for your faithfulness. And this is just what we've been talking about through the grants. We haven't even talked about what always happens in our church, the operating budget stuff. It's nice to have lights. It's nice to have heating and air conditioning. Um, we do great things in this church that are operating budget. Youth and children's ministries, um, uh, our, our senior adult ministry, our older adult ministry, sages, the work that they're doing is incredible. Our Stephen ministry and the difference that they're making in the lives of other people. I'm not going to tout myself, but I'm going to sing the praises of this staff because we have one of the best staffs a church will ever have. We continue to support our denomination, our region, and our national offices. We are doing so much that there is no way we can talk about all of it in one period of time. We are an amazing church. I have to be honest with you, um, there are times I take this church for granted because this is just the church I know. It's the one I know. Um, it's the one I'm a part of. It's the one I experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is the one with which I'm familiar uh, but sometimes it's important for us to just pause and to just remember all that we have and all that we've done because it really is remarkable. And that brings me to the last thing on my pastoral Thanksgiving list, and that last thing is you. You are a remarkable community of faith, and I do not say that lightly. Um, you are bold, you're brave, you're faithful, you're sacrificial. You stand as a light in a world that desperately needs light. You know, this world is becoming more and more torn apart and more and more filled with fear and more and more divided every single day. And yet this church stands in the middle and says, hey, there is hope. Do you know how different you are from one another? This has got to be one of the most diverse bodies of people that gather in a church anywhere in the world. You are all over the map in your understanding of the way the world works and operates from your political to your economic to your theological understanding. You are everywhere on the spectrum. And there are times, even though you don't know it, that you passionately disagree with the person who's sitting next to you right now. I know. And I kind of get a kick out of it. Um, but here's the thing that I like about that is because we know that the thing that draws us together is more powerful than anything that can pull us apart. And that thing is Jesus Christ. And we place our faith in him over anything that this earth can throw at us. And that is what makes you the thing for which I'm most grateful on my pastoral Thanksgiving list. You know, for whatever reason, for the work of the Holy Spirit, First Christian Church is at this location right here in northeastern Jefferson County. This church has been in a myriad of locations throughout the years in the city of Louisville, and it has impacted each one of those very, very powerfully. And right now we are here. This is our inheritance now. This is our place now. We may or may not be here forever, but this is where we are now. And if you ask me, it feels like a land flowing with milk and honey. It's an abundant land with an abundant people who are doing great things for the glory of God. And it feels like God is in our midst more now than I remember God ever being in our midst. It is just remarkable. 
And God has a word for God's people whenever they find themselves living in the inherited land, the promised land. God has a word for them and a call for them. And it's a call that God began giving the people of Israel when they moved into the promised land so long ago. And it's a call that God still gives us today. I want to share with you those words from God that are found in Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first fruits of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. Now we are not an agrarian people. We are not a people who are going to go out and gather from the ground our first fruits and bring them in this place and put them in a basket. But we are a people for whom God has gifted and graced with the ability to earn wealth, to do well for our families, to do well for ourselves, and to do well for our communities. And everything that is on this earth, everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we could ever own belongs to God. And God says to us as a people of faith, take your first fruits and bring them and place them in baskets. And when you place them in baskets, place them in the plate, take them to the place where the Lord resides. Does God not reside here? Do we need any more proof that God is not in our midst doing incredible things? Today, we continue a journey that the people of faith started generations ago. In a moment, I'm going to ask you um, to take these cards. They're, they're, in, your, they're in your bulletin. They're, they're everywhere. Um, we wanted to make sure that you could get these. This is a statement of giving. And I wanted to say a couple things about this. Um, you do not have to fill this out. I do not want you to feel pressure. I do not want you to feel forced. If you're not a regular member of our church, what I want to invite you to do is first and foremost just pray for us because you've seen what we've been doing. This is the church that God called us to be. And I just want you to pray for us. For those of you who call this place your home, I really want you to think about staking your claim in what we're doing um, because it's so very, very important. People often ask, why do I have to do this? It's a faith thing between me and God. And you're right. But here's the reality. If numbers aren't written down on cards, we can't budget. And if we can't budget, we can't plan. We plan our budget based on what is written and what is not written on these cards. If it's not there, we can't count on it. Um, so we can't be the best stewards of your gifts to God. We need that planning. Um, and you can see the difference that it's making. We are well on our way. Um, on the back of that card is a chart. We're shooting for the 5% range. That's a communal average that we want to have. Some of you are going to be at the high end of that. Some of you are still taking steps to get there. That's okay. Together we are family. And we're trying to get to that place. Um, but I really want you to prayerfully uh, fill this out and to think about your giving for the coming year. Um, there are stories yet to be written. There's stories yet to be written. If we don't continue to live faithfully into God's call, a lot of those stories are going to be unwritten. I don't want that for the church, and I don't want that for our community. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band um, to come on up and to get ready. Um, and